Hello viewers, this is Chris Porter here with another demonstration of the Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security product. ACS, as we call it, is a Kubernetes native container security product designed to bring security into the world of shift left and DevOps and designed to reinforce the goals that organizations have in adopting a, uh, an agile development model with, with DevOps. The product here uh, covers uh, on the left hand side, you'll see I'm logged in to the main dashboard here, uh, covers six major security use cases. Uh, we cover vulnerability management, which is understanding what known vulnerabilities are present in container images. We'll dig into this in a little bit. It covers network segmentation, which is understanding the relationship on the network between your pods and external and other pod in entities in the environment and building network policy rules to help isolate applications and data from each other. We're going to look at compliance, which is uh, a suite of controls that represent industry and uh, regulatory benchmarks out there for workloads and for the infrastructure. You'll see some features here that integrate with Red Hat's compliance operator to provide CIS benchmarks for the OpenShift cluster that we're running in as well. We're going to look at configuration management, which is a basket of controls that define how an application interacts with Kubernetes. When we look at an application uh, in a containerized environment, we tend to look at the container itself as being the end-all be-all of an application. But there's a lot of specifications in the deployment that give us information like how it's interacting with Kubernetes itself, what service account privileges, how it uses the network, or how it might interact with storage or other services that give us a lot of information. These configurations have risk associated with them. And in many cases, they're as or more important than the vulnerabilities that might be present in an image. We're also going to look at uh, runtime attack detection and incident response. Um, as applications are running, whether it is interacting with Kubernetes or the activity related to, let's say, a potential breach in a vulnerability on a container application, we're going to monitor that runtime lifecycle uh, and provide remediation. Speaking of remediation, before we dive into this, I want to talk about the, the, the idea of, of shifting left and DevSecOps. A lot of what we're going to surface here in the dashboard is meant for us to understand the risk, uh, to decide what's acceptable and not acceptable risk, and put it to place for remediation. But that doesn't mean that we're going to directly address the remediation in a running environment. In keeping with the DevOps approach, we want to go back to the source code. We want to fix the configuration or the image that brought the problem in in the first place so that we get a permanent solution. And then we want to rebuild and redeploy. In a DevOps world, we have an automated pipeline that is kicked off by a manual process, or it could be automated based on a, a merged pull request. But something has changed, that triggers a rebuild and a redeploy. And that pipeline is an ideal place for us to inject security controls. Here, for example, the most common use of this would be to understand what vulnerabilities are present in the images and the dependencies in the, of the files and applications that I have there. Uh, developers are going to be responsible for what they bring to the environment. We're going to help them understand here that they have serious and fixable vulnerabilities, meaning that upstream, a vendor like Red Hat has provided a fix for these vulnerabilities, and they need to move to a version of the component that uh, that supports the, the fix for these, these noted vulnerabilities. Uh, essentially, we're setting a guardrail, right? The security team here is deciding that we don't accept you advancing in the pipeline if you're bringing in a serious vulnerability that has a known fix. We're not asking anyone to go out and fix BusyBox or, or Alpine. We are asking that teams take advantage of fixes that are out there. We're also looking at, and this is a preview of the policy engine, we're looking at other policy uh, output here that helps teams understand uh, how they can improve the security of their applications. And the goal is to change those application source code, change that configuration in a Kubernetes native way with controls that are available on any Kubernetes cluster to permanently improve the, the risk stance of your applications. We look at things like how service accounts are being used. This is unfortunately one of those defaults in, in a Kubernetes deployment that's not so good for security. We don't want applications to have access to the Kubernetes API at all if they don't need that. Certainly something like a privileged container which has access to the host should be rare or non-existent in your environment. Some of these policies are going to be driven by, by compliance or industry benchmarks like Docker CIS. Uh, this policy covers a pretty standard security principle of running as the least privileged user account that we can. 
And again, unfortunately, this is an example of uh, a default that is, is useful for productivity. It helps people get started easily, but it's not the best way to run this in production. And you're gonna see this theme throughout the demo again and again, as we surface a problem, as the security team is investigating an incident, it points to a solution to be able to harden your applications at the source code level, make those changes, rebuild and redeploy. So let's use the dashboard here to surface some problems in our environment, understand the risk level of those problems and be able to craft a policy or use a built-in policy to, um, to remediate those. I started with vulnerability management earlier and, and this is a great place to get started. It is a foundational control. Every organization needs to have vulnerability management. This includes an awareness of where images are coming from um, what the developers are building into them, what dependencies they have. We could dig down here into the level of the source code that was used to produce this and the files that were copied in. But the focus here is on what we call fixable, serious vulnerabilities, right? These are vulnerabilities that could result in a remote code execution or a uh, privilege escalation, and they have a fix published, right? We're not asking anyone to go out and fix, you know, uh, LZ4 or curl or the, the, the Linux kernel, we are asking that they take advantage of fixes that are out there. And so a vulnerability like this, um, this is an easy gate to set, right? That if there's a fix available and you're using this component in your environment, then you need to adopt those fixes. Um, in many ways, just establishing a good DevOps process where we rebuild and redeploy on the regular is going to prevent this kind of thing from getting promoted into the environment in the first place. That's why I like to say that the best thing you can do starting out in, in Kubernetes native security is to make sure that you've got that established automation process. Now, this vulnerability here impacts more than just this one image that I'm looking at. In fact, it's present in four different deployments. And this is where the larger picture of risk comes in, that I have four different deployments impacted by the same vulnerability. And let's say it's a remote code execution vulnerability. Well, within the four applications, there's this different risk assigned here automatically. This is a customizable risk model that ACS uses to determine really how likely it is that an exploit is gonna be uh, available and, and how much power uh, an attacker will have once they land that, that execution, uh, that vulnerability. So in here, I've got number one is my, my visa processor. And the reason that this is more likely to be exploited is that it's exposed on the network it has other vulnerabilities, right? In fact, if we look at the risk page and I, and I move to a new page in the UI, you'll see that overall risk ranking for all of my applications. And the number one is a combination of these bad configurations, uh, bad vulnerabilities, bad privilege levels, and activity in the containers after they started that tells us that there's potentially uh, an attacker in the midst. Now, these policy violations we're gonna dig into, they are customizable both from what they're detecting, the criteria they use, as well as the severity of them. But you can see that this one here is a bad combination of things. I have some very serious vulnerabilities called out. I have uh, very high levels of privilege. Down a little bit lower, you can see what we call the service reachability. Really simply, an application that is listening on the network, particularly those that are exposed outside of the cluster, have a higher likelihood of being attacked. This is a front-end service. It has uh, networks that, that are wide open. It's more likely to be attacked. And in the prioritization here, this is the first application that should be addressed, that we think that, that as you're dealing with vulnerability problems or other configuration issues, it's not always feasible to solve every problem all at once. And so we wanna inform that prioritization that may be going on in your environment. Now there's a lot that we can do to improve the security of this particular application. As we go down the list, you'll see that the, uh, the, the list of policy violations is a little bit shorter. As we go down further, you'll see that um, we are seeing some activity and some suggestions here, but there's less of those critical vulnerabilities and less of those critical configurations. We're gonna look at what we wanna do about it, but there's also opportunity here, right? That we have a look at something like running a privileged container, um, that we see things like a package manager being executed. Down here at the bottom, we're seeing a service account token that's being used with cluster admin level of privileges, right? These are all bad things, right? These will allow an attacker to make use of the environment to good effect to impact other containers, other pods in the environment, or the cluster itself. 
Um, but but by taking the, the the recommendations that we have here, we can actually use those same kind of controls and the same kind of approach to to harden our applications by reducing the surface area of attack by reducing the privilege levels. We can actually make a, a an attack on an application like this much less effective. Speaking of which, here in the process discovery tab, we are looking at what actually occurred here after this container started. So much of what we discuss here is going to be configuration. It's static. But this is the dynamic part, part of this. And the ACS product is monitoring every pod running in my environment and every container within those pods. And I can look at the activity here in a list. I can see that uh, a shell command was spawned. This is a classic pattern for the exploit of a Java application. We see the Java runtime uh, spawning a shell command here, in this case, to install software. We're seeing the follow-on from that, so we see this chain of attack. And if I look at this over time, you can see another pattern here, that this changed behavior at some point. So we're looking at a variety of conditions, right? We're looking at the fact that uh, we don't expect to see things like a shell or a package manager running at all in a container context. And here we're also showing that we don't expect a change in behavior. We're leveraging the power of this constrained runtime environment with containers to understand that anything that, that, that is out of the norm is potentially a bad thing, right? Containers do not live interesting lives. They're not virtual machines. They're not general purpose. They generally follow this pattern of a flurry of initialization activity when they're first instantiated. And then they settle down and get kind of boring. And we can leverage that here to understand that anything that's not boring is potentially suspect. And we're identifying that automatically with what we call baselines. Uh, in my case here, we've got the, the startup from a Java application and we see the Java arguments here. That baseline can be modified. I can also lock it so that we tell the system effectively that yes, we agree that this is the baseline and this is what should be running. Now, one of the, the rules here is a, is a package manager, right? And I'm picking on the package managers here in this demo because this is legitimate software, right? Even if it doesn't have any any vulnerabilities in it right now, this is legitimate software that can be used for malicious purposes, right? And there's a lot of things like that, shells, compilers, and other uh, developer or debug tools, even tools like curl and wget that are really useful troubleshooting tools also have value for attackers. And so there's a whole category of policies designed to help teams understand that these are useful for an attacker and that by removing them will create less surface area for attack. All of the risk indicators here are driven by the policy engine, whether it's runtime, whether it's configuration, and that policy engine is a single policy engine. We're looking here at one set of rules that cover different life cycles. I can combine rules across that life cycle. So for example, I can look at uh, vulnerability data as well as uh, deployment and namespace information, labels. I can look at privilege levels so that I can go in and create a rule that says, um, you know, I don't want anybody mounting sensitive host directories in specific pods uh, versus others. That I want to be able to um, identify vulnerabilities in privileged containers. Um, those attributes are actually different life cycles. They're different parts of the environment, but with a single policy engine here, we can um, we can uh, compose a single set of policies um, that go across all those different silos there. Now, I mentioned package managers, right? One of my favorite punching bags here in security. This one is specifically around the execution at runtime. There's a similar uh, policy here for the package manager being present, whether it's Alpine or, or Red Hat or Ubuntu. These are useful utilities that can be used in malicious ways. And so again, we wanna uh, identify these, that they're in the image and available for an attacker. And that allows us to uh, help the developers understand that they can pretty simply remove those things and in a small way, improve the application security. Um, we also, of course, look at this at runtime, that somebody actually executed this and that means that someone's either really confused about containers, right? That they're installing software or something or maintaining software. Uh, maybe a developer or ops person that's new to this model and doesn't understand that these changes are gonna be lost or it could be malicious. And we're using that runtime information to indicate that 
there's a solution to this long term, which is again the same, the idea of reducing the surface area in the image build. And this is where the maturity of that DevOps life cycle comes into play. That if we can quickly make a change, rebuild and redeploy, we can very quickly respond to this and permanently resolve this particular security limitation. Now my policy here at runtime is uh, aligned to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. If you're using the MITRE ATT&CK framework to inform your security efforts, um, we've pre-built uh, attack techniques that correspond to this um, to show that you're either detecting or preventing the uh, attack technique that's outlined in this particular section of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, we're also uh, here, if we edit this one, we're also able to do things like impact the scope um, there's a lot more to this policy engine here, but what's important about it is this rationale and the guidance, right? That we want to be able to tell someone specifically, hey, there's something you can do about this. And so all the policies are written in that way where they provide guidance to the development teams or to whoever is operating and building this application, that there's something they can do to resolve that. Um, when we talk about enforcing this as well, it's not just about feel good, help, helpful hints. Uh, the security team also needs to be able to put enforcement rules in place for things like build and deploy time attributes like uh, privilege levels and, and opening up a privileged network port or uh, contents of images. We want to get this early. We want to enforce early. And so going back to my DevOps environment and my pipeline runs, I can see that I've actually caused some of those pipeline runs to fail. Once the security team decides that the risk reaches a level of unacceptable, we can cause that build to fail. And the security, uh, the development team that's responsible for this is gonna see this message and understand they have to do something in order to get past this, this quality gate or this security gate. Now, that's not enough. Unfortunately, um, application developers could bypass the, the build pipeline. Maybe somebody has uh, gained access uh, illicitly to the clusters and they're now gonna deploy their own workloads. We see this with some of the crypto miner attacks. We wanna protect the clusters directly and that's where the deploy time enforcement comes in. We don't invoke our controls here at the container engine level or at the process level. We do this with the Kubernetes API, right? That the Kubernetes native approach means that we're using things like the admission controller, uh, or in the case of a runtime enforcement, we're going to use the, the pod action of, of delete, right? Kill the pod here to enforce these actions. These are well understood. Um, it doesn't create a situation where your security tool is now in conflict with the orchestrator because with ACS, they're absolutely aligned. The deploy time enforcement provides the same message to the deployer as we saw in the build pipeline you're gonna be rejected for this reason. Now, these policies, of course, are totally customizable. I can create a new policy anytime. I can use the, uh, the built-in criteria. One of the most convenient ways to use the policy engine is actually through search filters. And so if I were to search for, let's say, a given CVE here, and I wanna go look for the new-ish Spring Boot, I can go out and find that vulnerability. I can also look for other information like uh, you know, exposure levels. And once I'm happy with my search filter here, I can create a policy from that. This allows that natural flow from uh, an investigation of an incident and, and scenario building to being able to create a policy that would identify that going forward. I wanna jump here to another aspect of threat detection and to, to policy building, which is the network graph. And if you're familiar with, uh, with you know, networking tools, you may have seen diagrams like this that attempt to track all the networking activity. The, uh, the, the, the OpenShift infra infrastructure that we're running on gives us a convenient place to probe this information. And the goal here, of course, is to understand that uh, you know, two applications are communicating with each other, who's accessing this database, but more importantly, to use that information to be able to restrict the access there. Again, one of those unfortunate defaults is that in a Kubernetes cluster, I have rules that are available, but that are not in use by default. In other words, any pod that's running a service can be accessed by any others. And if I switch to my allowed view here in the network graph, you'll see exactly that. Uh, my front end is wide open. My operations environment is wide open. These dotted lines and the red mean, you know, bad. And so 
we have an, a you know, potential where an attacker who gets into a front end environment because somebody's running an old WordPress instance um, could then move laterally across the environment to get to other uh, pods here. We're talking about firewalling, essentially, or segmentation, um, but instead of VLANs and, and IP address ranges, we're talking about pod and deployment names because the notion of an IP address or a host name in this context just doesn't make any sense. Now, what we want to do about it is important. And in this place, this is where ACS really differs from any of the solutions out there in that we've always taken a Kubernetes native approach, right? We could build a firewall. We could build something that would actually act at the pod level or at the uh, Linux kernel level to investigate, apply rules, and to uh, enforce those rules at the network layer. But there's a better option. And what we've chosen to do is to support the Kubernetes native model uh, by using network policies. This illustrates, I think, most clearly what we mean by Kubernetes native. We're surfacing issues here with the runtime to be able to understand where a threat might be might happen, um, to understand which of my applications are at risk of being exploited and how lateral movement could impact that. And then we're suggesting rules here that would go into OpenShift to be built in to restrict access to those pods. Um, this is really important in that we're, we're not providing a firewall here. ACS does not have a separate networking component that creates risk in your environment that something like that could fail and cause either a fail open situation where networking is allowed or fail closed, where now your applications are offline. We're using here the, the network policy capabilities that are already in use in your environment um, to enforce those rules, right? We really want developers to consider this as part of the code. It is a configuration that impacts their application. And by building it into the code, we make for much more secure applications overall. Um, I can copy and paste these into the OpenShift interface. Uh, really a better way to do this is to make sure again that it's part of the application source code. This kind of specification impacts the performance of uh, the applications and how they function in different environments just as much as the, the Docker image or the, the deployment data or the, uh, the, the behavior at runtime. We think it's just a part and parcel to how these applications are going to be defined. The last thing I'm going to jump into is compliance. Um, there's a lot more to see here, obviously, in the product, but um, we're going to keep this short and talk about this last major function area. And I saved it for the end because in many ways, you've already seen all of these features. Okay, Compliance is really rolling up a lot of the security policy we have. It's putting in a concrete way the principles of container native security, um, build, uh, build pipelines being used to examine and uh, to enforce rules around vulnerability scanning, um, to uh, embedding clear text secrets using configuration of the environment here. And so the, the controls here have a corresponding policy in the policy engine. So the ACS product is measuring here effectively, are you using the clear text secret policy? Are you using the vulnerability management policy? And the policy is what connects the dots between a high level control like um, you know, NIST uh, 411 here to the, the individual fixes communicated to the individual teams that they need to be in compliance. We want to avoid the problem where we tell somebody, hey, you have to be PCI compliant and leaving them to interpret what that means. What we've done here is taken a pretty aggressive stance to interpret the controls that are uh, required, the technical controls here, um, to guidance that's available in a Kubernetes native control. I mentioned that these controls are many things that you've seen already when it comes to PCI and isolation of uh, payment card data. We talk about Kubernetes network policies instead of uh, internet connections, DMZs and, and firewalls. Um, we're looking at uh, configuration standards here. You'll see that uh, PCI compliance here is not covered entirely. Um, there are gaps because many of the controls are either not technical or not applicable to this environment. And so the, the, this is a part of a larger PCI compliance effort. Um, you can see vulnerability scanning here. Again, we're looking at the control here provided by the PCI standard and providing you with guidance. Um, another way to look at this too is, is by namespace. So when we're looking at the compliance standards that apply to namespaces like vulnerability rules and, uh, and, and uh, the use of secrets and privileges, um, it's I think more convenient to look at this down at the namespace level. I can, uh, I can see where the, the standards are applicable and where they're not. I can understand within my organization 
which teams need help, right? Which teams are, are, are achieving the goals there um, and which teams have, frankly, have work to do in order to get to that level. Uh, one of the other things we're seeing in compliance is configuration benchmarks. Um, in this case, something like the CIS benchmarks for OpenShift 4, this is a recommendation produced by CIS and by Red Hat. Um, and you can see I'm pretty much alone, you know, pretty, pretty compliant here with this particular configuration standard. Um, these are reading the open SCAP rules that are part of the compliance operator. It just provides a convenient place for security teams to review the results. Um, I often all like to say, though, you're, you're only going to be as compliant as you can prove. And the graphs and the, the charts in this UI are very useful for determining where the work is to be done. But we also are going to have to supply this. And if you are seeking regulatory compliance uh, internally or externally with an auditor, having that evidence as a spreadsheet is going to be what you need in order to show that you have the controls in place for every single workload out there. And that evidence file is something that's easily exported. So that's it for the functional areas. There's a lot more to look at. Um, we haven't looked at any of the administration, but the product uh, supports single sign-on role-based access control, integration with uh, Docker registries and, and uh, container repositories, notifiers for uh, integration with external bug tracking, uh, chat ops and SIM tools. Um, there are uh, built-in support for administration through API tokens. It's very easy to deploy and roll out. But that's it for the demo today. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks.